I've been having a blast with Assassin's Creed Mirage, and I've got a bunch of key tips you're going to want to know before starting your journey as a hidden one in the city of Baghdad. I wish I had known each one of these from the start, so my aim is to help you get the most out of your time with Mirage, whether you're a seasoned assassin or this is your first AC game. We'll cover stealth tactics and combat strategy, the best gear to get, which skills to focus on, the most useful tools to unlock, and lots more. Of course, we're going to steer clear of story spoilers here, and huge thanks to Ubisoft for hooking me up with a review code so I could uncover all these tips for you guys before you take your first leap of faith on your way to becoming a master assassin. Now, the city of Baghdad is definitely the main attraction in Mirage, but once you arrive here after the first couple hours of intro and tutorials, you can take your camel and go explore a bit before continuing the main narrative. I was really glad I decided to explore the northern part of the map for an hour or so first, and I don't want to spoil anything too much, but you might want to consider poking around the northern oasis for a little bit. Exploring pretty much anywhere is a lot of fun though. There are really cool historic locations to visit, secret caves, and even underwater caverns to dive into. Of course, you'll want to keep an eye out for viewpoints where you can do a quick animus sync to unlock them as fast travel points. You can fast travel to these from anywhere on the map, so you'll definitely want to swing by to pick these up on your way to other objectives. Once you do arrive in Baghdad, you'll also unlock the assassin's hideouts, or bureaus as they're called, but the game won't clearly tell you that these also serve as fast travel points. Running around the city, you'll very quickly realize that it's incredibly dense and full of opportunities for mischief like pickpocketing, sneaking into restricted areas for gear chests, and getting into fights with guards. You'll also quickly learn that you gain notoriety if you're caught performing many of these actions. Notoriety, indicated by this red bar, basically turns the city against you, raising the level of awareness of civilians and guards, and making it much more likely that you'll be spotted, pursued, and end up in conflict. This is definitely exhilarating, and I think the system's great, but it can become a bit annoying when you're just trying to get on with a quest and every guard in sight keeps attacking attacking you, so you definitely want to keep your notoriety as low as possible. Once you surpass level 1, if you linger somewhere too long, civilians will begin pointing you out to the guards, who will then come over and attack you if you don't move away. However, as long as you're still below level 2, you can pretty much get around without any trouble as long as you stay on the move. Surpassing level 2, however, becomes much more dangerous, with additional archers posted on rooftops and guards of all types ready to attack if they see you. To get back to safety, you need to run away and break line of sight with them, which will be indicated by Bassam's outline appearing as sparkling dust. Enemies will investigate this last known location, and you'll be able to shake them by getting further away. I generally found this easiest by climbing some buildings and doing a bit of parkour to get out of sight. Then, you just need to wait for the awareness meter to cool down past the yellow blinking stage. Now, get all the way to level 3 notoriety, and the elite Shakiria guard will begin to hunt you down. This guy is no joke. He hits hard and fast, has a ton of health, and can even heal himself with elixirs. The only good thing about him is if you can kill him, your notoriety will be completely reset. So if you're confident in your melee abilities, which I'll give you some tips on in a bit, this can be a nice way to reset your notoriety. However, I think the vast majority of players will want to avoid these encounters entirely. The best way to do that is lowering your notoriety by tearing down your wanted posters around the city. These won't show up on the map, so to find them, you need to keep an eye out for this icon on your compass. Now, a similar icon that looks like a torn wanted poster indicates the Herald, or Moon who will completely reset your notoriety if you bribe them with a power token. This is a great option too, but these tokens are pretty rare and they're really useful for other purposes. So I wouldn't recommend using them to bribe heralds when you can tear down wanted posters for free. There are actually three types of tokens in the game and each can be used with a different class of NPC. With the bronze power ones, you can bribe the herald and reset your notoriety, as we said, but I think you're much better off using these to bribe mercenaries to attack and distract guards for you, which is actually really effective. You can also distract enemies by giving a silver scholar token to a musician, but I would definitely recommend you instead use these to buy maps from cartographers, specifically treasure maps, as these will show you where to find gear chests containing new weapons, outfits, and the upgrade schematics required to upgrade them. We'll talk more about gear later, but we also have the green merchant tokens, which will allow you to pull off social stealth by bribing merchant groups to conceal you. You can also open certain locked chests with merchant tokens, but my favorite use is giving them to a trader to permanently reduce the price of goods at all traders. I would definitely do this early on as you'll frequently be visiting the trader to restock on tools like throwing knives and smoke bombs. Also, pro tip for all types of merchants, the buy quantities will roll over to the largest number you can purchase if you go backwards, so that's a nice quick way to stock up. Anyway, perhaps the best use for all three types of tokens is during quests, where you can use them with certain NPCs to get important information for a shortcut or even change how particular assassination events 
events play out. So I definitely recommend keeping at least a few of each token on you at all times. But how do you get tokens? Well, you'll get some by completing contracts and other activities, but the best way is definitely to simply spend some time pickpocketing people around the city using Eagle Vision to easily spot coin pouches. You can rack up a nice stash of tokens this way and pickpocketing is pretty fun. Now, the other benefit is that you'll get a bunch of trinkets you can sell to traders for some coin, which you'll need to purchase both tools like throwing knives and upgrade components for your gear. Of course, you can also pick up plenty of coins and trinkets by looting pots and baskets all over the map, but you'll also encounter a few different types of chests. We already mentioned the chests locked with a merchant token, which give you some basic loot in larger quantities compared to their regular lockless versions. But there are two types of chests you really want to keep an eye out for. The first being these ammo chests that will give you a few throwing knives, smoke bombs, or other tools. By the way, there's one of these in each of the Assassin's Bureaus, and they appear to respawn each time you finish a quest, so definitely grab that easy loot. You'll also sometimes find throwing knives specifically in makeshift targets, on tables, or stuck into things like straw blocks. These glow gold under Eagle Vision, and in my experience, they do seem to respawn after a little while. The other type of chest to look for are the big gear chests, which contain a new weapon, outfit, or upgrade schematic. And yes, I have tested it, and the gear locations are set. These chests are not randomized, so you can bet I'm working on a video and spreadsheet for all the gear locations. If you'd like to see that, or if you've been finding these tips helpful, leaving a like down below would be much appreciated. And consider subscribing so you can be sure to get that gear info when I have it. In just a minute though, I will give you the location for what I think is the best outfit to grab as your first upgrade. More generally though, gear chests can be a bit tricky to access. I don't want to spoil all the puzzles, so maybe skip ahead to the next video chapter if you don't want any hints here, but I'll give you just a few. You'll often need to break through some wooden lattice in a window or floor, which you can do with your sword. However, if they're out of reach, then a throwing knife does the trick. You'll also run into a lot of doors barricaded from the inside, which you can sometimes remedy with a well-aimed throwing knife through a window. There are also rubble barricades that can be destroyed by chucking one of these red explosive pots at them. And in general, don't forget to use Eagle Vision to scan and evaluate puzzles. In addition to enjoying the puzzles, I've also been loving the stealth focus of the combat system. The unlockable tools make stealth even better, and we'll talk about those in a minute. But early on, and honestly throughout the game, perhaps your strongest move is the instant assassination from stealth. Not only is this an instant kill for basically any enemy, but it's also a lot of fun climbing around to find cool angles to attack from. Of course, the whistle call pairs really well with this, but it's also stronger than you might think because even if guards are bunched up, only one will come to investigate. So you can easily pick them off one by one if you're patient enough. Later on, you'll unlock the assassin's focus mechanic, allowing you to chain a series of instant kills. You can only try trigger it outside of conflict though, so this is definitely another stealth mechanic to utilize once you have it. I personally think tools give you some of the coolest and most useful options though, so I would highly recommend progressing the main story to the point where you can unlock a few as soon as you can. I've been testing all of the tools pretty extensively, and three of them clearly stand out as the better options to unlock first. You'll automatically get throwing knives early on, which is great because I personally think these are the most useful and a ton of fun. You can easily take out enemies at range from the shadows with these. Keep in mind that while aiming with a knife, the enemy's health bar will show how much health they'll lose when hit. You definitely want to be aiming for the head to take them out in one shot, although you'll notice that you can't one-shot heavy guards with knives. I'll show you how to use my other favorite tools to do that, but if you happen to come across a flamethrower guard, you can one-shot them with knives by hitting the fuel container on their backs. Tools can also be upgraded using resources, and I absolutely recommend investing in two knife upgrades as quickly as possible. Specifically, you'll want extra capacity to increase the number you can carry, and then Light Blade on the second tier might just be my favorite upgrade in the game because it both extends the range and increases the strength of your knives by simply charging up a throw. We'll talk about skills in a minute, but knife recovery makes knives insanely good because it allows you to grab them back by simply walking over to the body after using them. Don't worry too much about picking the wrong upgrades though, because even though you're locked into your tool choices, you can respect the upgrades at any time. The next tool I recommend you unlock are definitely smoke bombs. You can throw these from stealth to confuse enemies and then either slide in for a kill or sneak away undetected. Defensively, they can serve as a panic button when enemies
enemies are pursuing you, either allowing you to escape or turning the tables to pull off some instant assassinations within the smoke. Keep in mind, you do really need to be in the cloud for this to work though. Smoke bombs are particularly useful for taking out heavy guards because you can instant kill them just like any other guard after catching them in the smoke. Once again, I recommend going for extra capacity on tier one and then healing vapor on tier two, which will heal Basim by 25%. The third tool to grab has got to be the blow dart, which I find super fun. Similar to throwing knives, these allow you to take out enemies at range by temporarily putting them to sleep. Then you can either leave them snoozing while you slip by or finish them off to ensure they can't cause you trouble. Similar to smoke bombs, I find these especially useful for heavy guards. However, their armor blocks hitting them in the head or body, so you need to aim for their unarmored feet. As for blow dart upgrades, extra capacity is my tier one recommendation again, especially since there's no recovery option like with knives. On the second tier, I grab cloud impact to expand the area of effect, allowing you to put multiple enemies to sleep with a single dart if they're close together. But lethal dose is pretty good too. So knives, smoke bombs, and blow darts are definitely my top three tools, at least before you get to the end game. You won't be able to use stealth for every encounter though, and Bassam is pretty squishy, so you definitely need to know a bit about melee combat as well. First off, you want to get into a defensive mindset for melee. It's all about being patient and waiting for the opportunities to parry the yellow attacks and dodge the red ones. Parrying not only keeps you safe, but also deals damage to the enemy's defense bar, which is displayed on top of their health bar. Run the defense bar all the way down and you'll get a prompt to perform an instant finisher, which by the way has invincibility frames so you won't be damaged by other enemies attacking while you perform it. Now personally, I think the yellow and red flashes for attack show up a bit late, so I learned pretty quickly to watch for the enemy's attack animation instead. You don't have to wait for the yellow flashes to successfully parry. It's also worth noting that you can parry projectiles, which is a bit more advanced, but comes into play with that elite Shakiria guard who throws knives. When dodging the red unblockables, keep in mind Bassam can only dodge roll while he has stamina, so you definitely don't want to spam dodge. Oh, and if you're fighting on the rooftops, don't worry about dodging off the edge by accident. Fortunately, you can't do that. Now, you will need to go on the offensive at some point, and we have the R1 tap for a basic light attack and an R1 hold for a heavy. Both attacks use stamina as well, so you need to be conservative with these two. I've found it's often worth taking the time to do more heavy attacks, not only because they deal more damage to the health and defense bars, but also because they can somewhat stun lock enemies and even interrupt their attacks if timed just right. They also barely use any more stamina than light attacks. Both types can deal damage to multiple enemies at once if they're close together, but the heavy attack also has a slightly larger area of effect. Healing is done by consuming elixirs, and these will heal you all the way to full no matter when you use them. So it's best to wait until you're pretty low on health to pop one. Outside of combat, you should conserve elixirs and instead heal by eating from cooking pots around the map. All right, let's talk gear. As I mentioned, new gear and schematics required for upgrades are mainly obtained from gear chests hidden around the map. Maps from cartographers can uncover some for you, but you'll also come across them naturally while exploring. Definitely scan with Eagle Vision often to keep an eye out for them. Once you find one, it will show up on your map and compass as a gold chest icon. The best early sword and dagger I've managed to find are honestly the basic initiate items you get during the tutorial section, so it's worth investing in upgrades for these when you can. The sword has a perk that increases damage by 50% for your first hit after a successful parry, and the dagger gives your parries an additional 25 defense damage, which will help bring down the enemy defense bars. In fact, if you can get the dagger and sword upgraded to level 2, they'll deal enough defense damage to make the weakest enemies one shot after just one parry. The initiate outfit is decent as well, but I'd highly recommend sneaking into the upper harbor as soon as possible to snag the Zanj Uprising outfit from the ship's puzzle room. This one will reduce how much notoriety you gain from illegal actions, which is super handy for keeping the civilians and guards off your back throughout most of your playthrough until you can get some of the endgame gear. Now, I hate to say it, but the Prince of Persia items from the Deluxe Edition, in addition to looking really cool, are actually pretty good. The Dagger of Time in particular is awesome, because pulling off a parry will slow down time for three seconds, giving you an opportunity to get in some easy damage. The outfit has a similar perk that allows you to survive a killing blow once per combat encounter and also triggers slow-mo. The Sand Sword complements these with a perk that heals you by 20% if you manage to kill an enemy with time slowed down. Honestly though, I think it's better to combo the Initiate Sword with the Dagger of Time because you'll have an easy opportunity to get that 50% damage boost during the slow-mo. So my recommended early to mid-game build is the Zanj Outfit, Initiate Sword, and Dagger of Time. If you don't have the Dagger of Time, you'll be just fine with the Initiate Dagger. Okay, now let's talk skills. You can redistribute skill points anytime, 
time, but I would start by unlocking pretty much the entire trickster tree, specifically starting with the right branch that contains elixir pocket to carry an additional healing potion, knife recovery, which we mentioned earlier, pickpocket master, which makes it even easier to rack up tokens and loot, and engineer, which is really good because it lets you choose a second tier one upgrade for each tool. The left branch gives you additional tool capacity, so you'll definitely want to pick up at least one or two of those as well. Although, keep in mind that those particular skills can't be reset. I'm thinking about doing a dedicated skills video to dive deeper into all the other skills, but after Trickster, I would start working through the Predator tree. Finally, let's check out a few settings you may want to adjust. Under Controls, there's a setting to adjust menu hold times, which is pretty nice to reduce if you want to make menu interactions snappier. I also personally like having Eagle Vertical Control on Inverted. On PC, there's a walking speed setting to make Bassam walk a little bit quicker, and in the Customized Controls area on PC and console, you can pretty much adjust anything you'd like. I'd recommend setting Dismount Disembark to press instead of hold. This controls getting off your mount and boats, but it also controls the input for letting go of movable puzzle objects. And lastly, if you'd prefer to make things less bloody, you can find the blood effects toggle under the gameplay tab. All right, guys, those are all my essential tips for getting the most out of Mirage. I've got lots more content coming your way, and I'll throw my next Mirage video up if it's ready by the time you're watching this. If you found this video helpful, leaving a like would be much appreciated. And if you want to chat about the game, you're welcome to come hang out in my Discord server. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll catch you in the next one.